so far see anybody from the public here. Am I missing something or does that seem correct? No. No, I did not let anyone in from the public. No public, okay. They come in, we'll acknowledge them. Um, I think um, this is all housing partnership members. Beverly, you're here for the first time as an official member. Um, I think we're expecting Gwen too. Um, so let's let's wait for a moment for Gwen to see if she joins us. Let's go on to um, the meeting minutes first and see if we can approve them from last month. And then we'll get back to you and Gwen for just a quick introduction. Sound good? Okay. Okay. So with no public comments, um, let's go to the May minutes. I have a couple of a couple of corrections for them. Can I go ahead and say that? Yeah. So at the very end of the first page, um, when we're talking about um, small area FMR tied to Springfield, um, there were many cities across the state. state that were concerned with the new HUD formulations and Northampton was approved for 120% small area FMR for all 15 zip codes. I think Northampton just has three zip codes and I think the 15 zip codes refers to the whole Springfield area, but I'm not sure. So just that kind of a technicality. And then the very, the very last um, word on the second page starts with me. Carmen, Juno, and, and then it's a dangling sentence. I think I was saying something there, but I have no idea what it, what it might have been. Just take that out if everybody's in agreement. Does anybody else have any corrections or thoughts? All right, would somebody like to put a motion forward to approve the minutes? Oh, hi, I'm sorry, Carmen. Yes, uh, I'm here. Um, I just wanted to clarify that the um, the uh, the sentence where it says about uh, 15 zip codes, uh, I did. Uh, uh, that was uh, something that I read from uh, the information I got uh, from the housing authority. Uh, uh, so that's why it was, uh, I believe, why it was t transcribed that way, um, okay. because that's actually what I said. Um, whether I'm correct 100% or not, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. So I'm not sure what to do about that, but I just but I know that Northampton has three zip codes, and I think the 15 revert, refers to the larger area. I can... uh, yeah, I was. Re I think it was referring to also the fact that the Northampton Housing Authority uh, recently acquired the um, the Hampshire. Housing Authority, which includes right. uh, several other zip codes, uh, but even with uh, uh, that acquisition, I'm not sure that it totals up to uh, uh, 15 uh, zip codes. Um, yeah. But I, I guess we could just say, you know, uh, it has several uh, zip codes. I mean, why don't we just say Northampton was approved for 120 percent of the small area FMR? Period. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. that sort of keeps it with some clarity. Yeah. I can Any, I can also annotate the notes to say, you know, this is what was said, but, you know, we later clarified um, the information. Um, I, I think, um, you know, in the denim, although it wasn't said there, um, you know. Okay. I'm, I move that we approve the minutes as amended. Anybody second? I can second. I'll, second. Oh, I'll third. <laughs> okay. Do we need to take a voice vote? Keith, remind me. Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, so Beverly and Gwen, you weren't here. So Gordon, I'll start with you. Yes. Hannah? Yes, sorry about that. Jen, you weren't here last time, right? So you can't vote. Okay, okay, Ace. Yes. Richard? Yes. Edgardo? Yes. Sarah? Yes. 
and I'm a yes too. Okay, the minutes have been approved. Now, I wanna go back for a moment to Gwen and Beverly. Um, um, I wanna welcome you to the committee. This is your first official meeting. Um, we don't have anybody else from the public here tonight, so we didn't do introductions early on. And I think both of you were in attendance a couple of months ago when we, when we all did introductions. Um, I wondered if there was anything else that you would like to say before we move on to a couple of bigger agenda items. Okay. Well, I will, I will just say I'm, how happy I am that um, I'm here and looking forward to working with you all. I think I did a, a fair amount of introducing yourself last time. So well, yeah. we'll have big time for that this time. Okay. And I'll say the same. Thank you for having me and I'm happy to be here. I think um, you'll both add um, some really important perspectives. So thank you for um, making the effort to be on the committee. Uh, I also want to say that Julio told me a number of months ago that he was going to resign from the committee when others were coming on. So he just sent me an email saying that he has officially resigned and um, wishing you all well. So I know I'll miss his, his voice, um, but um, yes, things move on. Okay, so we have Shelly Goring who's gonna check in with us right around six o'clock. Um, but meanwhile, we wanna discuss the draft of the op-ed that was sent around. Now, I know Gordon that you had offered some revisions and you had sent them to me and Keith and I don't think that they've been sent out. Um, the revisions were fairly major. Um, I'm not really sure what to do about that. So I think it would behoove us to have a conversation starting somewhere. I'm not even sure where. Well, I, I, I could, Keith has it if Keith wants to circulate it or I could just, I, I have a copy open on my, um, on my computer. I could also share that people wanted to just read it. I mean, it's not a long letter, but I, what I, let me just also preface what I did is, I mean, the letter, the letter was, the draft that was circulated was fine. I, it's just that I felt like the front end needed to sort of have more of an explanation of why this was important uh, to our community and what it would actually do. I thought that was missing. And so that's really what I did. Um, and then the back end, uh, talking about how uh, the letter also went on to talk about how this shouldn't be considered to be anti-anti-business. I thought that was good. And I kept pretty much all of that in place. Mm -hmm. So I'm open to just sharing it uh, now if people want to look at that draft <clears throat> and compare it to the one that was circulated. I'm, and I don't know, maybe others also had put some thought into, into revisions as well. So uh, there might be others to consider. Yeah. I think we have a good 15 minutes. So that would be my, my inclination for you know, to go ahead and share that. Let's all look at it. Uh, Ace has their hand up. Ace. Um, one thing that I wanted to see in the letter that I don't remember seeing, and I might have overlooked it, it might be in Gordon's edits, uh, but I would like some kind of call to action for next steps of this, um, particularly, I believe the next step is, um, you know, petitioning our legislature, legislators, letting them know that we want to see this happen. Um, I'm not clear if there are any other next steps for this, but I felt like that was missing, uh, particularly since the city council did vote on the bill and unanimously approve it. Okay. So good point. So how do you wanna proceed now with Gordon's revision of the first few paragraphs, Richard? I don't mind if Gordon screen shares, but I would like to have a doc, a copy of it emailed just so that uh, I, sort of have I will it. forward it right now, but in the meantime, I'll make uh, Gordon co host so that he can share his um, screen. Yeah, it'd probably best to have it a uh, copy that you can also just scroll through on your own because this 
view is not going to um, uh, get you the whole content. So if you know if you scroll down, you'll see that at the bottom of it pretty much keeps intact um, some of the original letter. And I, I I also thought that we should save the other issues for another day because it's getting off into tangents and things that we we just want to focus on the um, home rule petition. But I think if you focus on the first these first pa three paragraphs, it, it kind of gives you a different sort of lead into why this is important. So uh, has it been sent? Should I continue scrolling down? Are people reading? Uh, I have it. I've got it in my email. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to check it right now. Anyone not have their email open? Because I, then I can take, uh, stop sharing and make it easier that we can all see each other. I've got it. Got it. Sure. Is there someone else who has it that wants um, to make notations about the actual draft? Um, what, do you, what do you mean by that, Keith? Just comments or just, uh, edit, like live edit the drafts. Right. So Ace's comment about call to action, I did not get that in there. And it may be that we can find a way to incorporate that sort of as a closing um, piece okay. of it. Um, I'm not sure what the next step is at this point either, though. Right. I think that um, this is this is automatically going to the state legislature. Um, but I don't really know the timeline for that. And Ace, I think what you said about contacting our own representatives um, and uh, at least as number one would be a call to action. But I'm not, I'm not clear on what the timeline is for getting into the legislature. One thing this, you know, one, one question that I have is I cannot remember the process for our last op-ed, but um, you know, Hannah and I spent a long, many hours each on this. And I wondered if for the next op-ed, there was a way to bring in more people during the process of writing it so that we wouldn't be uh, uh, getting these very excellent suggestions, but sort of at the last minute um, to incorporate ACE. So um, I, I believe the best way to do that would be to have something like a, a secondary meeting and officially announce it so that it is publicly available and recorded for the purposes of open meeting law. And then everyone who wants to attend and give feedback does during that process, as opposed to doing a subcommittee meeting, um, which, which follows a, a similar process. But I, I think logistically that may be the best way to do that for things like this in the future. So, so when we get to that future, we should review uh, the different procedures that we can put into place to make this a little more streamlined. Yeah. I'm not so sure a committee that's drafting an op-ed needs to be a public meeting. I think the decision on whether to support sending it to the Gazette is an action that needs to be done in open meeting. But I don't think the drafting and, and the work of the homework that we do between meetings is stuff that needs because we're not taking a official action. We're just putting we're putting work together. And I know over the years I've run a committee. We've had many we've had many subcommittees that met privately um, back then. We used to meet in person um, and worked on things and then took it to the full committee as in a public meeting to then uh, uh, ask for the full committee support. <clears throat> 
that's fair. I was assuming that um, a majority of the housing partnership would want to weigh in on it, yeah. which turns it from a subcommittee into the housing partnership. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we're talking about two things. One is this particular op-ed and the draft provisions that Gordon offered. And secondly, is the future process. So let's leave the future process <laughs> for the next time. How are we going to handle this? Since I think this is a major revision. Do, are people having a chance to look at it? Do we want to all look at it later over the next few days? And then how can we get back together about this? That's my question. And I don't know. Well, um, what I would say is I would propose a vote to accept the changes and submit the letter as written. And if the majority of the housing partnership agrees, we do that. And if not, then we give it a few days and by necessity vote on it at next meeting. Mm -hmm. So you're saying accept the, um, the letter is written with the draft revisions, right? Uh, that, that was my that proposal. That offered, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Edgardo has a hand, as does Bev. Ed, Edgar? Uh, yeah, um, I'm in agreement with uh, Ace. Uh, I had actually uh, read the previous uh, version um, and just uh, reread uh, the email that was sent now and looks uh, really good to me uh, if uh, the rest of the committee wanted to uh, go forward with it. Okay. Beverly, did you have a hand up? Uh, yeah. Um, please call me Bev. Bev. And, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I'm having a hard time absorbing the substance of the letter while people are talking, quite frankly. Um, and as a new member, though, I don't want to hold this up. I know it's important to people who have been spending time working on it, you know, prior to my arriving. So I'd be happy to take a pass on this one. Um, I have a, a bunch of questions because I'm just getting my head around the, the whole issue. Um, there are parts of it that sound rather defensive to me, and I'm not 100% sure why. The, the, the edits are, are the large print because I don't. The edits are what's red. in red. Um, so the version I have doesn't have red. Okay. Uh, it seems like the the uh, I have that same version. Uh, it's not red, uh, but it seems like the edits are actually in a smaller font. Smaller font. Okay. Um, this so, should be tracked changes. I don't know if there if that did not come through, but the version. Yeah. No, I think I just need to open it yeah. word, and then it'll all. Yeah. Any um, of it. I'm happy to say yes you guys have been working on this go with what you like i think it would be great if we could have a policy around how we do this in the future because group, mm -hmm. group authoring is hard um definitely yeah what do other people think richard oh uh, let me on okay um i i think that we're have long felt that this is something we want to support and how to best do it is something that I've been um, I have a, some concerns about the area where we're talking about anti-business uh, and these are minor but I think this is an area where language and meaning so uh, in the third sentence of that paragraph that starts the proposed legislation I, I wouldn't call it very much pro-business, but I think we could uh, characterize it as um, supportive of business interests or something. I, I, I'll get back to that. And mm -hmm. the other thing that uh, I just have a little bit of trouble is that sort of, how about all the folks in Northampton who work in service industries that we all use? It's sort of the uh, switching to the sort of chat mode in what is an op-ed, and we need to say that as a declarative sentences. You know, mm -hmm. um, this um, this affects and will benefit. This problem affects, and this solution will benefit 
you know, or something like that. But the how about doesn't do it for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will uh, try and get you some wording on that other sentence. You know, uh, otherwise, I think it's expressive of, you know, what we have been talking about for some time. I mean, it sounds like there are numerous edits here. I don't know if we can just approve this now and just have this go out. I think we need we need a different process here to edit it and we can wait another month to approve it. I mean, this is a lot, right? Gwen and Hannah have hands. Gwen? I, um, I, I just wanted to say it would be so good if I could have more time to look at this because um, I love editing actually. And um, and so, um, and also I've been attending the city council meetings. I pop in there. And so I've been uh, um, listening to these discussions and the input from different people and everything like that. Many of us have. So uh, I just want some time to think about it. Um, so if that can be possible, that would be great. Thanks. Does somebody else have a hand up? Uh, just me, Sarah. Um, oh, sorry, Sarah. Um, oh. <laughs> um, Good, uh, thanks. Uh, well, first, Carmen, I just wanted to say thank you for like actually pulling the like all of these notes into an op ed. Like, I know that it was a lot to synthesize, and that we had talked about like, are we going to focus on the home rule petition, or do we want to make it this like overall really positive picture of all of these affordable housing. Uh, projects that are happening right now in Northampton and you only get like 700 words or something to do that in so thank you for mm -hmm. doing this um, right. and yeah I was also just curious in terms of like a, a process of I would love if there was a way to incorporate some of these edits because these actually don't sound too significant to me while also not having to wait another month and I I don't know if that's possible at all uh, or what that process looks like, or if we're just bound by open meeting law here at the level where next month is when this has to happen. Um, so that, that's just a question that I have. Sarah. Um, I, I just want to, well, um, I, also share that question, Hannah. I'm not sure it's like process question. So I'm not sure if we can get an answer to that quickly. Uh, I mean, um, but take just because being more new to the whole, oh, my connection's unstable. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm gonna stop my video. Um, just you know being more from that perspective of not knowing so much about and not having worked on this for so long if it's coming across as defensive to you i think that's um that's valuable to know because you know the people reading this from in you know are are, are going to be coming more from that place of not having the background so i just wanted yeah. to remind that Gordon, did you want to say something? Well, Bev was ahead of me. I'll let her go first. Okay. okay. So it's it's it strikes me that a number of people would be interested in having a few days at least to give some additional feedback. It does seem a shame that we have to wait a month. Uh, all the people who have been working on this have to wait a month. Is there a consequence that we know of to to waiting that month? That's exactly where I was going to go. I was wondering, is there a reason why this has to get out this month? Can we wait until, I guess it'll be July, um, and give people a chance to to uh, share comments on this redraft, um, which I could recirculate as, as a clean copy without the, the redlining, um, and people can, and I do think it's in fairness that people might want to add you know, my draft is not perfect, so it's it's what people might want to add or, or tinker with the language as well. And I, I do, I think that Richard makes a good point about, now that I'm reading again, it, it does come across as somehow being defensive in this, be very careful how we describe the, uh, you know, the, the business, how it, it's anti-business. I don't even want to concede that it is that, so maybe we can find a better language for that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, thinking about, 
and there is a, there is this piece of it that's sort of off putting about the think about the uh, the, the people that do the services, like there's some other, they're not part of our community. They're people that, that like work for us. That, there's a, that sort of image comes across as you read this. And I don't want to express that. Well, I don't think there's any reason why we can't wait until July. I mean, this is an ongoing issue. It's not going to come in front of the legislature anytime in the next few months. Um, and so I think we have time to to edit it and to come back in July and hopefully we approve it. The question is, what is the process for editing? How can we do that and not violate open meet meeting law? Or can everybody be on Google Docs and edit? Ace. So um, based on the conversations that I've had, I think that us all being on the Google Docs and editing is definitely a violation of open meeting law. Um, that said, I think it would be acceptable if, for example, we all had a base draft that we were working from. Um, I think it would be acceptable to send to the group, you know, I would like to add this somewhere. I would like to change this paragraph. There just can't be discussion about it. Um, and assuming that a majority of the housing partnership wants to give feedback about it, uh, which it sounds like we do, um, then I think probably the fastest way of doing this would be something along the lines of, we have a draft that we work from, we send any changes or proposals we want to keep. Uh, you know, let's say with a due date of at least one week before next meeting. Keith then bundles those proposals, sends them all out to all of us so we have a week to look at them before next meeting and so we can vote on them. And it may be that some of them are the same edits. It may be that some are mutually exclusive. Um, but I think that's a way of doing this that would not fall afoul of open meeting law while still giving us time to have impact and input in you know, a, a, a reasonable way. Richard? I think Ace is on to something. I, I believe that we might need to consult the higher authority about open meeting law. I think as soon as there is any kind of back and forth between meetings, we're in perilous waters. And the notion of everybody submitting and then the compendium of submissions going out as a matter of public uh, you know, access to that um, probably would have a better chance of passing muster. But if, and, and I think we need to also check in on the subcommittee issue. I know, you know, we had tons of subcommittees before there was this kind of pronounced concern about open meeting law. And I, I don't know where they stand now. So I see Shelly has joined us. Um, how are we going to wrap this up? Keith, do you have any comments on the process and procedure here? Yeah, I, I, I BCC everyone in every email. Uh, specifically, she do not um, have a chain reaction or reply all. Um, it's perfectly fine to send me materials and then I will send it out with the the minutes in the agenda with reasonable time so everyone can do that but that chain reaction where a talks to b talks to c um, that's when we run we're on a foul um but i think uh ace um is a pretty good idea about that um the setting up the um all the drafts to me perfectly fine okay and so, and so are we agreed that the initial draft op-ed will be the one where Gordon provided his edits and then essentially ended in the way that the first op-ed was, right? Gordon's edits entered in. Are we all agreed that that, 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 that is the draft op-ed we're going to work with? Can I just Gordon? make one more point? I don't think it's wrong for us to authorize a committee to draft an op-ed and, and, and basically synthesize comment uh, the edits that people want to contribute. The public does not have a right to write the letter with us. 
The only thing we're going to do is in open meeting is authorize a is say we approve as a group. This is the final draft that we want to send out to the public. But I don't think the process of getting there is is actually taking any formal action. We're not we're not deciding to issue a permit here in, in secret. We're just deciding to write a letter to the editor, and we can write that letter and just and then an open meeting approve the final draft. So I think that there could be a committee that might work with Keith. Maybe it's Carmen. Gordon, um, Hannah, and I that might look at the final draft and write the final draft and circulate that before the July meeting for a final look. And people who want to add comments can do that before that. Richard? I would love for what Gordon said to be the case because it sounds logical and plausible. I just think we need to check in with somebody before we do. Also, I just sent to Keith some very brief edits that I discussed in this meeting. So uh, I would invite that to be included in the draft as an add on to Gordon's with everybody's permission since it's been happening in meeting. Okay. It sounds like we're gonna work with the draft op-ed. People are gonna send Keith their ideas. Um, and um, if we can, I mean, if we can, we can form a little subcommittee towards the end and kind of, you know, put the fine points on it. I don't know, Keith, if you're going to check that out and see if that's possible or where we want to leave it. We do need to move on in just a moment to Shelly because she's joined us from Boston. I will uh, double check on the, um, the how to do that. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. So send your suggestions to Keith. All right. So, Shelly, I want to welcome you to the Northampton Massachusetts Housing Partnership. Um, I think uh, we should, would you like us to all go around and introduce ourselves or are you okay not? We don't have any members of the public tonight. We are all housing partnership members, including two, um, Gwen and Bev, who are brand new and at their first meeting today. But I leave it up to you what you would like. Um, I think quickly, if you would introduce yourselves, give me a little bit of sense of who you are would be fantastic, actually. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I'll start. I'm Carmen Juno. I'm the chair of the partnership. I had some email contact with you. Um, and I've been on the partnership for um, three years. I had previously worked work, work with homeless veterans, among other things that I did. Welcome. Um, Gordon? Hi, Shelly. I'm Gordon Shaw. Uh, I'm an attorney. I work at a legal aid program here in Western Mass called Community Legal Aid and been on the partnership for over a decade. Hannah? Hi, Shelly. I'm Hannah Schaefer. I am a renter in Northampton. I've been on the partnership for uh, maybe, maybe two years now. <laughs> Time flies. Richard? Yes, my name is Richard Abusa. I'm a local property manager. I've uh, been on the partnership since the beginning, which I think is over 30 some years. And uh, mm -hmm. that's it. Bev? Uh, Beverly Bates, uh, recently retired from the community builders. You perhaps know them. Um, I spent most of my career working there in various capacities, um, uh, but at the end uh, was responsible for uh, leading the development group. Um, I now live in Northampton and I've been on the partnership for about a half an hour. Thank you, Bev. Uh, Ace? Hi, Shelly. Uh, Ace Taylor. I've been on the partnership for, I guess, two years now, same as Hannah. Uh, I'm a landlord and homeowner in Northampton. Sarah. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I've been on the partnership for about two years as well. Um, I'm a registered nurse. I work in Northampton at the hospital. Um, I've worked with a lot of addiction and homelessness. Uh, I also put myself through nursing school while living in, um, in public housing. So um, that's my story. Uh, Edgar. Hello, my name is Eduardo Cancel. I'm a 
um, renter in Florence. Uh, I've been on, on the partnership for about four or five years. And I'm also a member uh, of the uh, Northampton Housing Authority uh, Board of Commissioners. Jen. Hi, Shelley. I'm Jen Derringer. I'm a managing attorney at Community Legal Aid along with Gordon, uh, and I have a background in housing law. Gwen. Hi, hey, Shelley. My name is Gwen, and I am a new member of the Northampton Housing Partnership. And I'm actually also a resident in public housing, and I'm a full time student transferring to a new school. Thanks, Gwen. And Keith. Hey, Shelley, uh, staff uh, for the Housing Partnership um, in the Planning and Sustainability Office. So um, we'd love for you to introduce yourself, but, and also let, let's just segue right away into why we invited you here. We've been talking for close to a year about housing trust funds, um, the pros and cons. Um, there have been a variety of opinions. There have been a variety of opinions given to us by um, a couple of other city employees. Um, we actually have a housing trust fund from the past that we understand still has $1,500 in it even though it's been um, you know, uh, not used for a long time. Um, we're always looking for ways to increase funding. And so we wanted to invite you here so that you could advise us on this matter. Thank you. Yep, so do you mind first? Um, well, I, l l let's get into it and then I'll ask you um, later. So um, can I share my screen? Of course. Yeah, I just made you co-host. So can you see the, the slides? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, fantastic. So <clears throat> I am Shelly Gehring with MHP. I've been with MHP for about six years. And for those of you who may not be as familiar, we are a quasi-state agency in Massachusetts focused on increasing the supply of affordable housing all across the state. And we have essentially four key teams or legs to our stool. We have community assistance team, which I'm a part of. So we really work in helping to build local capacity to support affordable housing across the state. We have a lending team that actually lends to build and um, to create and preserve affordable housing. So we've lent over um, $1.4 billion to support the creation or preservation of over 27,000 units of housing. We do have kind of a niche where we focus really on primarily on affordable rental housing. We have the homeownership team, which has the one mortgage product, which is a unique product to Massachusetts. It's the most affordable first time home buyer program in the state. Uh, it's a fixed interest rate of 30 years and there's additional subsidy available for households earning up to 80% of the area median income. Buyers receive the mortgage through traditional lenders, but MHP manages the back of the house of the program. And then we have a newer team, which is housing data. So we have a, a small group of people that are collecting, analyzing, and, and disseminating data to help inform housing policy on the local, regional, and, and state level. So I've been with MHP for six years in the community assistance team. And a lot of my work is helping to support communities that either want to create an affordable housing trust or have one, and they're trying to um, build kind of build their capacity. I also do a lot of work with communities that have the Community Preservation Act. So helping communities to use more of their resources for affordable housing specifically. So tonight, I, you're in a little bit of a unique place because according to your website, you do have an municipal affordable housing trust that is set up. You still have that. It, um, it appears on the books, um, but it just hasn't been active and you're trying to decide whether or not to, to invest some time and resources into it. So I'm gonna do very limited um, basics about affordable housing trusts because I'm assuming that in your research, you're probably doing some of this yourself. Um, I'll get into a little bit of some operations and best practices, just some of the things that we suggest that communities, um, that affordable housing trusts, um, some practices that we suggest that trusts um, follow. And then very briefly on eligible activities because I know that 
you have some CDCs that are active in your region. Northampton is certainly invested in affordable housing, so you're likely more familiar than, than some of our communities, but we'll touch on that a little bit. You should feel free to interrupt me if you have questions or if something's not clear. Um, just feel free to, I can't see everyone, so just unmute yourself or Carmen, however you want to facilitate that. Okay. So just very generally, the Municipal Affordable Housing Trusts are organized under uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 55C. This is apparently what I saw from your website, the housing trust that you have. It is a public entity, so it's, it's not separate. It's a municipal board. Um, it's not separate from the city. It's a municipal board. It's created by your, it would have been created by your city council, just a majority vote. And the purpose is to create and preserve affordable housing. So municipal affordable housing trust, it's actually not, uh, it's not everything housing, everything affordable housing. The, the um, purpose is fairly narrow, actually, this create and preserving affordable housing for low and moderate income households. Low and moderate income is actually not defined in this statute. So we urge communities, trust to define that upfront of what that means to your community. And we suggest that you look at existing definitions of low and moderate income. So if Northampton is a community that you want all of the housing that you invest in to count on the subsidized housing inventory, then that would be 80% of the area at median income. If you're using CPA funds, CPA allows, um, defines moderate income as up to 100% of the area at median income. The states, Affordable Housing Trust defines moderate income up to 110% of the area median income. Um, so we just encourage communities to think about that upfront to be explicit about how you're defining low and moderate income. And then it's led by a local board of trustees. Because it's a municipal board, like your other boards, it's subject to public procurement, designer selection, conflict of interest, and public meeting laws. So because of public procurement, uh, we never suggest, and because trustees are volunteers, we never suggest that trusts actually be developers. Um, we would always suggest that you have private entities do the actual development. So very broadly, your trust can address affordable housing needs that you've identified in the community. The trust can support local control of housing initiatives. The trust can actually engage in real estate activity to buy and sell real estate. From what I could tell on your website, it didn't appear that any of your the powers granted to the trust were um, modified, but um, I didn't read through an ordinance. The trust can make timely decisions because the trust doesn't have to go back to city council for approval unless that's written into your ordinance that, that created the trust. And then as a municipal board, the trust can be collecting funds from a variety of sources, which I'll get into in a bit. So just very basic, the statute says a minimum of five members. I think, I think that that's what your ordinance says as well. The mayor is a member of this board and the trustees are appointed by the mayor with um, confirmation by the city council. They're two-year terms. Most communities stagger those just so that there isn't turnover at the same time. And then the um, trustees are considered public agents, so special municipal employees, just like your other board members. So again, it's not something that is a silo that should be working outside of the city. It really is an entity to help to implement some of your goals, your housing goals that you've identified in the community. There are a variety of powers that are allowed through the statute. So you just want to um, re read your ordinance to make sure that, uh, to see if there are any limitations on these powers. In some communities, they might require certain powers to have um, oversight by the city council, or they might require a two thirds vote of trustees on the housing trust, that it's usually powers like borrowing against the um, trust assets. Um, some of those bigger kind of powers that sometimes communities put limits on. So you just wanna make sure that you understand how your trust has been structured. And then um, as we work in more and more communities, it's not really rocket science of the kinds of things that are important to help a trust to be effective in the community. One is just having some money to work with. Two is having a vision, a, a sense of what the trust role is in the community, leadership that can help move things forward, and then transparency, openness in the community. So one thing that's been actually exciting is that we have communities being more and more creative around how they're trying to fund affordable housing locally. So there are a variety of different resources. 
CPA is clearly one of the most common. Uh, about 76% of our communities that have an affordable housing trust have the Community Preservation Act. So that is definitely a resource. It's not a guarantee in every community and it's certainly not the only resource. We have some communities that have inclusionary zoning and they have an in lieu of um, payment that's allowed in some cases. And in, in some communities, that's those that in lieu of payment is directed to the trust. In Swampscott, they actually have it written into their inclusionary zoning bylaw that the trust gets to determine the formula to determine what the in lieu of payment is. And then the money is transferred to their trust. We have some communities that have transferred free cash funds from their general fund. So Truro and Brookline are examples. Um, we have some communities where the income from tax title sales may be directed to the trust or Chelsea is actually transferring tax title properties to their trust to be redeveloped into affordable housing. And MHP is working with them on one site at this point. Um, we have a community on the Cape that has a cell phone tower and the lease, the funds from the lease uh, are directed to their trust. It's not a lot of money, it's just a little, but it's something. We have um, one community that actually bonded a million dollars, Medfield bonded a million dollars to seed their affordable housing trust. It's the only community that I know of that's done that. And they don't have CPA, so they didn't bond it against CPA, they bonded it against their municipal budget. And Orleans on the Cape, passed a tax override, a $275,000 tax override that's directed to their trust. They see that as a permanent override. And so they're the only trust that I know of that actually has been able to receive a line of credit with a bank because of these, this funding source. Donations are always an option of property or cash. Um, you likely know the real estate transfer fee legislation. There's individual communities that are trying to get in real estate transfer fee passed in the legislature. There's also a statewide enabling, um, a bill that would enable this statewide that's um, hopefully, hopefully will pass that many communities are considering using those funds. Um, we have short-term rental fees. There are a couple of communities that I know of for sure that are directing short-term rental fees to their trust. There's Gloucester and Brewster. There may be developer negotiated fees. You have to be cautious about how you do this, of course, that you don't cross any any lines, but in some communities that has been, that's generated some funds for their trust. And communities, I've heard some communities talk about the marijuana tax or income from marijuana tax. I haven't yet heard of any that have established that. So the, the point really is that communities are trying to find a, a variety of ways to fund affordable housing locally. Um, we suggest with every trust, new trustees, that you start by familiarizing your, yourself with local housing needs, identified local housing needs. I couldn't find anything on your website that was more current than your 2011 um, housing needs analysis. You maybe have something else. If you don't, I would encourage you to update this. That you have current data. And the graph that I have is just from Datatown, which gives a lot of different data points. That's also a resource that you can use. But what it shows is just that you have renters that are particularly cost burdened in Northampton. Uh, but we always suggest that the trust start with um, as current data as you can get so that when they're thinking about what they're gonna do, um, the initiatives or developments that they're gonna fund that they are starting with current data instead of assumptions about what the needs are in the community, but they're, they're starting with current data about um, the housing dynamic in, in Northampton. So we would suggest that the trusts, um, if you don't have more current data, that you would that they would start with that. But then that, that the trust, we suggest that you spend some time setting priorities. So really getting familiar with the data and then thinking about based on the needs that have been identified, what should the trust focus on? And to try to focus on some key things that have been brought up in your housing needs analysis or your housing production plan. Um, to acknowledge that our housing needs are really significant in all of our communities. The resources are always limited and it's a volunteer board. So try to be realistic about focusing on some things instead of trying to do everything at once. And then there could be a benchmark that you establish if there's a particular need that you really wanna focus on. Um, Somerville is a community where their trust has identified a certain percentage of their funds they want to go towards the lowest income household. So, a lot of our affordable housing ends up being priced at 80% of the area median income. A lot of the need is um, 
lower than that. And so Somerville has just identified a certain amount of their funds to households earning less than I think it's 50% of the area median income. So it's just a, a reminder to themselves and it's a cue to the community and to developers that they have a particular interest in meeting the needs of the lowest income households, not just at the higher end. Jolly, can I ask you a question, please? Sure. Yep. Um, when you say that Somerville, for example, um, has an investment in helping the lowest income renters there, um, does that mean that the um, housing trust fund subsidizes those renters? In other words, practically speaking, how does that money get to help the lowest um, income renters? So I think what they're saying is that they want to entertain funding developments that are structured to benefit, to support lower income households. So okay. I don't know exactly how that plays out, but what they're saying is that they, they don't wanna just support affordable housing developments at 80% or at 100%. They wanna make sure that they're putting funds into developments that support lower income households as well. Thank you. And we encourage trust to create a mission statement. So to help to um, focus the trustees, but also to help the community understand how the trust sees its role in the community. I just pulled these off of websites for Brewster and, and Amherst. Um, I appreciate Brewster's interest in really creating a, a, a diverse socioeconomic, diverse population. Amherst is reminding the community in their mission statement that they're a, an entity of the town, that they're working collaboratively with the town. But we suggest that trusts start with this, creating a mission statement so that they are just focused about what their role is in the community. And then to do some kind of planning. So this looks different in every community. In some communities on the left, um, Beverly did some in-house planning. They had a little bit of capacity in their planning department and they completed their housing plan. So they're over 10% on the subsidized housing inventory, but they had a consultant. They were updating their housing plan just so they had a good sense of what was going on um, in the housing market in Beverly. And then they created some guidelines for how their trust was gonna operate. And they identified eligible activities, the things that they were gonna focus on funding based on what their housing plan identified as needs. Um, Brewster did a, created some goals and some strategies. They did that in-house um, just with their trust, their trustees. And then on the right is Amherst. So some communities hire a consultant and they do a more um, full-blown kind of five-year strategic plan. So it looks different in different communities, but we do suggest that trusts take a little bit of time to do some planning, to not try to jump in because what we see is that trusts end up spinning their wheels because the needs are so great. And the capacity of one board that's uh, made up of volunteers is limited. So we really suggest that the trustees take some time to do some planning and have some kind of um, public engagement component of that as well to receive feedback so that it, it feels like it's collaborative, that it's engaging other housing entities in the community as well. And that leads me to this is that when, you're, when you have multiple entities that are working on housing goals, that we encourage conversations early on. So if you did decide to um, invest in your trust again and revive it, then we would urge you, your, the partnership and the trust, perhaps the housing authority, any other entity that's gonna be focused on or is focused on housing, to have conversations early on to identify different um, roles in the community. For one, um, to help with accountability so that the trust doesn't think, well, the housing partnership's doing that and the housing partnership doesn't think that the trust is doing something, um, but also to um, help from stepping on each other's toes, just so that you're early on identifying the differences in your role. This is just something that Hingham did in their housing production plan. And then we all know that housing development, affordable housing in particular, can be incredibly controversial, unfortunately. So we urge trust early on to be transparent in the community, to report back to whatever boards, entities that you have identified as being critical, um, that you report back regularly. In some communities, they might have a joint meeting once or twice a year with different boards. Um, we encourage the trust to have a early on a, a build a relationship with the Community Preservation Committee. When the trust invests in developments or in programs, promote that. Use your webpage to identify what you're working on, who's on the trust, any links to like the ordinance that established the trust, any programs you're funding, um, 
don't make it difficult for people in the community to understand the role of the trust, who's on the trust, and what the trust is working on. When there are vacuums, people can make their own story, and that usually isn't good when it's affordable housing. And then different trusts want to operate differently. So some just want to be like a community preservation committee where they have money in their account. They want to look at, receive applications, decide if they want to fund it or not. Some just want to do that. Some want to be a part of initiating. So during the pandemic, we actually saw that in several communities, it was the Affordable Housing Trust that initiated emergency rent assistance programs. So some want to be engaged in creating programs. We see more and more trusts involved in disposing of municipal land for affordable housing, whether it's transferred to the trust or whether the trust is just engaged in the process. So we're seeing more of that. And then some trusts want to be a part of advocacy in the community around affordable housing and education. So we would just encourage the trust to identify early how they're going to operate and to be open about that in the community and perhaps have that reflected in the mission as well. So I know I'm going a little bit fast, but I'm wanting to be sensitive to your time. And I have a two-year-old that's being babysat right now. So I'm going to shift a little bit into the kinds of things that a trust can be engaged in. And again, you may be really familiar with this, but um, we use the words, the language of, I use the language of CPA, acquire, create, preserve, support, these verbs that you'll hear the CPC talk about. Because a few years ago, the trust statute was modified so that all of the allowable activities under community housing with CPA are allowable activities for an affordable housing trust. Because support in particular hadn't been in the trust statute and some communities were transferring CPA funds and there were, were questions about whether it was uh, legal or okay for the trust to be supporting support activities. So now everything that is allowed under community housing for CPA is allowed for a trust. So that's why I'm using these verbs. So one example of acquire is this housing development that was in, um, it's in Barnstable and a non the nonprofit POA was able to use some local funds, $500,000 of CPA funds to um, leverage additional resources to buy the whole development and to rehab it. And now almost all the units, only some of them, I think it had been um, permitted under Chapter 40B, where only 25% were affordable. Now almost all of the units are affordable because of these local funds. There were a few households that were not income qualified and they didn't want to displace anyone. So a few are market, but almost all of them are now affordable um, because of these local funds that help to leverage this. So it's one thing that a trust can be doing is helping a developer acquire existing housing and to essentially buy down the units to be affordable um, in perpetuity. We have a lot of examples of CREATE. So this is the trust in Norwell where the community actually declared an old former police station um, surplus and then transferred it to the trust. In most cases, the property is, hasn't, we haven't seen the community transfer to the trust. We're seeing a few incidences of that, but this is a case where they decided to transfer to the trust and then the trust oversaw the request for proposals, reviewing um, the proposals. And then they chose a nonprofit developer, Metro West Collaborative Development, who then built this building of 18 units of age-restricted senior rental housing, one and two bedrooms. A few of the units are affordable up to 100% of the area and median income. And between the trust and their community preservation committee, they put in over a million dollars to help support this development. We have a variety of examples of reusing existing buildings for affordable housing. And sometimes there is a historic component although certainly not always. In Middleborough, um, at the time that the shoe shop place was being proposed by a couple nonprofits, the, their community preservation um, committee was new. And so the local funds, they don't actually have a trust, but their local funds that they put in it was really limited, like $30,000. They just didn't have the money yet, but it was enough for the, develop, the nonprofit developers to be able to acquire enough state resources to redevelop this building that had been a shoe factory into 25 rental units. And then in Stephen, in North Andover, Stevens Corner was a um, underutilized nursing home that the nonprofit developer Noah acquired and used about a million dollars of local resources to redevelop into rental housing. And then in Swampscott, this school, this is a, 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 a new project by a nonprofit named um, B'nai B'rith, where these are now um, apartments that are age restricted, that are senior apartments, 38 apartments. So sometimes you likely know that reuse of existing buildings can sometimes be less controversial than new construction. So it can be a great way to um, bring a 
underutilized building back online and to add affordable housing as well. With preservation, what we typically are thinking about is um, um, preserving the affordability of units. So again, this is actually not a trust funded project. It, it was um, Amherst, you may be familiar with this, but it was um, bonding by the CPA. So a trust would not be able to bond because we just don't have trust with the kind of income, regular income as a CPC has. Um, but this was a um, multifamily development, or it still is in Amherst, and 41 of the units that were affordable. The restrictions were set to expire because their financing under mass housing only had 15 year restrictions. Amherst was really concerned about losing these 41 units engaged with MHP and what was decided because the existing owner at the time did not want to extend the affordability. The community engaged Beacon Communities, a developer that has extensive experience in multifamily housing, affordable housing, Chapter 40B, TPA. Um, Beacon negotiated purchasing the development from the um, previous owner and the community voted to bond $1.25 million of CPA funds to preserve these 41 units in perpetuity to support Beacon in the purchase. So we have some affordable housing trusts that part of what they're doing is, is paying attention and monitoring um, affordability restrictions that are set to expire and then participating in the conversation to try to extend affordability in um, expiring, expiring use um, units. And then there are a variety of things that have fallen under support over the years. Um, Pre-development work. So if Northampton has some municipal sites and you just need to do a little bit of pre-development work to determine feasibility for affordable housing or to set the, to better understand the site, to write a, a more concise request for proposals to bring in better, better proposals from developers, the trust could be engaged in that. Um, updating needs analysis or housing production plan, the trust could potentially help fund that. And then rental assistance, as you likely know, is explicitly allowed in the CPA statute. So it's something that many trusts have been engaged in. Just a, re a reminder that I, I like to bring up is that when you are considering um, whether you're gonna reinvigorate your trust to consider your local infrastructure, the needs and the existing resources and to really consider if there is a, um, a niche for the trust to play, if maybe something isn't really being met in the community and um, to make sure that, that it's not gonna be duplicative, that it's not going to, um, be difficult to staff another board or have um, trustees on another board, volunteers on another board, plus some municipal staff to support it, to really think that through. And then we just urge trust to develop goals based on identified needs. It's, it's easy to kind of take the path of least resistance and we really urge trust to work off of identified needs, data that you've collected. And then as a volunteer board, be real about your capacity to try to do a few things well, to not try to do everything. We have a lot of resources at MHP, online resources. You'll get this PDF, I mean, you'll get the um, slides afterwards. So, uh, but these are a few kind of key resources. And then always feel free to reach out to me. This is my email, my phone number, and anyone feel free to, to reach out with any kind of questions. I'm, I'm happy to support your conversation. I'm gonna stop sharing. Shelly, do, Shelly, do you have um, do you have a few minutes for just yes. a couple of questions now? Let us know. Yes? Absolutely, yes, yes. Okay, great. So, who has questions? Gordon. So, one of the um, arguments that's been made locally, um, why it's not necessary to resurrect the the mm -hmm. trust here. Um, is that we have the CPA and the CPA does the job of, of ensuring that affordable housing needs are, are met. Um, and so I'm just, and, I, and, I, and having seen that seems like CPA seems to be involved in a lot of these transactions, which the trusts are involved in. So I guess I'm just want to hear from you why, what's the case to make uh, for having a trust, even though it's a community that also has the CPA. And embedded within that, one of the other uh, sort of related uh, sort of arguments is that there's a cost, a, a staffing issue that also needs to be taken. The city needs to have put some professional staffing on the trust as well, and, and that's another burden on the city. Yeah, so I, I don't think it's necessarily, I don't think a trust is necessarily needed in every community. I do think that thinking it through and being thoughtful is, is the way to go. 
Um, the part of the argument that I make in some communities is that the CPC members have to focus on four different areas. So it's not just affordable housing, it's also historic preservation, open space and recreation. Affordable housing is extremely complex and you're so lucky to have Bev who has very tangible experience but, and others of you as well, but um, affordable housing is really complex. So to expect CPC members to become basically like to some degree um, lay experts in affordable housing to really understand it and to really help to drive the creation of more affordable housing. It's a lot, it's a big ask. So for, in some communities, it's helping to build just the local capacity to do more affordable housing by having an entity that's focused exclusively on affordable housing. And if you want more support of um, having a team of people who are just focused on affordable housing and are helping to be more assertive in driving the affordable housing agenda and needs in the community, I don't think that a CPC can realistically do that. So if you want to kind of build your, your local capacity with an entity that actually can be engaged um, more nimbly in, the, um, in affordable housing development, then I think that a trust could be helpful. To be a really effective, it, the most effective trusts do have some kind of paid staff support. So it's hard to do this kind of work just with volunteers. So that is another thing to keep in mind with Keith and the other staff, if they have some capacity to support the trust. And that can look um, like some trusts want to be engaged in trying to identify potential sites for affordable housing, whether it's public or whether it's private, and they really want to be engaged in um, helping to move things forward, helping to engage developers um, in kind of moving the needle. And they need to be able to work with, typically with planning staff on that so that it's collaborative. So that definitely is something to consider. Um, you also need to think about whether you have enough people to seat another board and whether it's people who are really committed to affordable housing and not just filling a seat, not just being a warm body, but people who really want to be engaged in this. So I, I think that I can't answer that for you. That's something that Northampton has to think about, but I think all those things are important. Um, I, I just don't think uh, most CPCs are primarily just responding to applications typically. I mean, they may do a plan that reflects some of the community interest, but they're not necessarily out there being more active in getting projects done. They're reviewing projects and deciding whether they're gonna fund it. So to me, a, a trust has the capacity to be, to work a bit differently if, if that's the community's interest. Yeah, okay. More proactive, yeah. So Carmen, you're muted. Richard, I see you have a question. How many other people would like to ask a question tonight? Because we're sort of running out of time besides Richard. Anybody? I don't see any hands. Bev, Bev has a question. If she wants okay. to go first, that's fine with me. Okay. okay, so Bev and then Richard. Go ahead, Bev. I will make it very quick. Um, Shelly, I'm um, theorizing that a trust that has you know a reasonable amount of funding and a proactive stance um, can help bring resources to the community that might not otherwise come meaning other state funding um, this the uh, trust money is relatively small still in the whole funding package mm -hmm. but uh, the competition for funds uh, is, so, is so great that it would seem to me one more argument um, would be uh, leverage, um, keeping the state interested in funding your projects. Yeah, it's really important to have, as you know, the local funds that are supporting developments that um, those local funds are used then to leverage. And the local funds are always tiny compared to the state and federal resources, but they're critical because they're showing local support. And the trust oftentimes, trust oftentimes help to, um, oftentimes help developments with some of the local politics, helping to support it locally and have conversations with boards and, and helps to support um, on the municipal level, um, moving a, a development forward outside of funds even. So that's also, uh, I think, a really critical role that a CPC is just not, is typically not gonna be able to fill that kind of role. And on a CPC, only one person is required to be a housing person to come from a housing background. 
And in many communities, there's only one person. They're, they don't even appoint an additional person that's housing. So um, that's another, to me, that's another point of a housing trust that everyone, that everyone is there for the point of affordable housing. Okay, thank you. And Richard, your question? Yes, I wanna piggyback on what Gordon was asking about, about um, community um, capacity. Have you had any experience with communities that have felt the administrative burden uh, was so great on the city that they were regretted having an affordable housing trust fund? Or do communities with support and you know getting past their learning curve, do they uh, feel like it was a good choice for them? So I actually haven't heard it from cities. We definitely have had some towns, smaller towns have a hard time. And it's primarily that they just have a hard time finding enough people to sit on the board and to be active trustees. Um, so like Weston, a really small community, they ended up, their trust ended up absorbing, basically absorbing their housing partnership because they were just having a hard time filling boards. So we have, we do have an issue in smaller communities where they have a hard time just filling all the spots on a trust, having another board. I haven't heard it from a, a city, although, um, I, it, it may be why some like gateway cities don't haven't created a trust. There, there might be some capacity in, in some cities, it, which which might be why some communities haven't created a trust. I think it so reflect is a reflection of whether a community, a city, has a trust. It's a reflection of kind of the the political leadership in the community and how focused they are on affordable housing and increasing the supply of affordable housing. So some cities just aren't as focused on that for a variety of reasons. Um, other cities, it's it's more of a, a key kind of um, effort in the city. And so they, they have created the infrastructure, but it's, it's, I think it's really something that is built over time. And um, right now is not necessarily the best time for any particular community, but I think it's part of building the local capacity to support affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So if we you have, ask, you want Sarah to ask a question? Sarah? Is there time for me to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so one of our, goals is to increase the, the percentage of CPA funds that's utilized for housing. Um, do you do does a housing trust um, facilitate that? Is that something that you've seen? So we see housing trusts actively trying to build a relationship with the CPC to increase the amount of CPA funds that are directed to the trust and to housing. Um, Cambridge is a city that they transfer 80% of their CPA funds to their affordable housing trust, 80% every single year. So they, when they have their public hearing, the housing people pack it and they push to have the majority put into housing. Of course, their housing issues are very severe. So um, they basically use their trust as their community housing arm of their CPC. Somerville has been transferring about 45% of their CPA funds to their affordable housing trust. So they expect the, I think in Somerville, a developer could still potentially come to the CPC and go to the trust, but they're primarily using the trust as their community housing arm. In some communities, they might direct about 10% to their trust on a pretty regular basis. In some communities, they require the trust to fill out an application like everyone else. In some communities, they just put it on kind of the docket that they're gonna transfer 10% of the funds. Um, it, it, it plays out differently in different communities, but it's partly why we urge um, if you're gonna, if you're going to push to revive the trust, then I would start the conversations with the CPC now, really early on, to be building that relationship so that it doesn't become adversarial or competitive, and that you have a conversation around what, how does it work? Is it that the CPC transfers to the trust and then the trust funds affordable housing? Is it that a developer could come to either? Is it certain things that the trust focuses on and the CPC focuses on other things? So we have a community wealth fleet where their new trust is going to focus on development. The CPC, they're going to ask them to continue funding programs that the housing authority runs. So they've kind of separated the role of who does what. Um, so we would urge these conversations to be early 
And um, hopefully that the CPC is on board, that they, there isn't feelings of being threatened, that um, you can find a collaborative way, collaborative way to have the end goal be more affordable housing in Northampton. Good, in, good question and interesting. All right, I think we need to wrap this up. It's almost 10 of seven. Um, Shelly, thank you so much for joining us. This is really super thought provoking and I think it could be so, so useful. Put my email in the chat and feel free to reach out. Anyone can reach out. You don't have to just go through Carmen or Keith, like just reach out. If you have questions, I'm, I'm happy to engage. Great. Thank okay. you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Are there initial thoughts, comments, directions, explorations? Well, I mean, I wanted her to make the argument why we need it and, and she made it. So, I mean, I think many of us already already thought that way. So um, it's, it's a question of whether we have the bandwidth to sort of push this is something we want to start getting, finding sources of funding. And then I think at what she said at the end, making sure you're not in competition with the CPC is really important. So if we really were serious, it probably means we should invite, somehow have, uh, somehow get the CPC to our, our representatives to, the, to our meeting um, to discuss how this could work. Um, but Gordon, do you mean the CPA? Well, the, the, the committee, the CPA is the. Is oh, the I act. see. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. I thought I thought she also said something important, which was to kind of um, uh, think about whether your community can support, you know, a board um, and all that's needed um, within that. Um, yeah, I think she definitely made the argument for. Um, that this would be hugely, hugely useful for us to do. And as Ace would say, then what would be the next steps? Bev has a hand. Bev? I was gonna basically uh, uh, offer some of the same thoughts that Gordon did um, about next steps. What I, I am curious, those of you who have been working in this community a long time, how do you perceive, um, the importance of affordable housing among all of the other things that are so important to the city and that for me would be about the mayor and the city council and people who will either get behind and push with us or not uh to the extent that there are other things that matter more maybe that's a longer conversation than we have time for right now uh, richard Yes, I think you're exactly right. It's a longer conversation. And I think we got the, the advice that we go incrementally. I think we all believe it's necessary, but we want to do the setup in a way that we build the foundation. So I would suggest we put it on the agenda because there is, it's not an urgent thing. It's an important thing to do incrementally. So you would suggest we put it on the agenda for July? Yeah. Yes. Seems like a good, very excellent next step. Okay, so we'll do that, right? And let's move on then. Uh, new business, does anybody have any new business in the last nine minutes we have? Ace? Um, I thought oh, that I was oh, oh, talking about the transfer oh, fee. Go ahead. Um, so uh, in light of the amount of time, I'm not going to uh, share this to screen, but I have gone through the financial transactions from the last five years over Northampton and created basically a spreadsheet uh, that you can type in a percentage amount of a fee as well as you know what percent over median or what percent over average of either residential sales or non-residential sales in order to calculate out um, how much money would be made by a proposed transfer fee. Um, I'm very happy to send this along to Keith to send to everyone so that you can look at the data and play with it yourself. Um, 
basically the two pieces of information I wanted to point out is overwhelmingly the things being sold in Northampton are single family homes and condos. Um, overall, the median sales price of all residential is $300,000. Um, and this is across all residential things. If people want to see that broken up, uh, you know, more generally, if people want to see if the fee applies differently to different codes, I can do that and add that into the spreadsheet. I haven't on the first version. Um, but in terms of questions about uh, how many sales this sort of fee would impact, um, how much money is predicted to be generated. Uh, I now have those numbers and can share them. And that would be coming to us via the information that you're going to send Keith and he'll send out? Uh, yes, um, because I, I was going to show it. I don't think we really have time to do so today. So I will send a link to the work that I've done. I'm going to continue talking with the city councilors about this to see where they want to go next. Um, if there are specific questions that people want answered, I can, uh, but that's where the information is currently at. <laughs> Um, so is this spreadsheet, is it residential only or is it um, commercial transfers uh, as well? Uh, it's both, um, although there's only commercial data for the last four years, um, or uh, rather non-residential. Uh, and because of the fewer number of sales between, um, you know, commercial, industrial, and everything else, I did bundle them all together. Um, again, that is something I can split out if that would be helpful to see them separated. Uh, but the the document I have has all that information. So I think it'd be really useful to see the document and put this back on the agenda for for July. Okay, great. Good. The Ace, thank you so much. I mean, this is like really, it's really eye opening. And I know you've done a lot of work on this. So thank you so much. All right. Before I forget, I just want to say if there are more than nine people at this meeting, I can't see you if you raise your electronic hand and you're in my top row. So thank you all who are helping me um, keep track of this. All right. Any other business not anticipated in our last six minutes? Richard. Uh, yes, I think we have two uh, important thank yous in order. Uh, I certainly want think we want a, a group uh, appreciation of Julio, who has been a very thoughtful and dedicated member for quite some time and really added to our discussions and work behind the scenes. And so I would uh, encourage, I don't think we need a formal resolution, but uh, uh, you as chair or Keith to send a letter that the, the board expressed their very sincere appreciation for his service. Um, sure. And uh, the other is that Wayne is retiring. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, this is our last meeting under his tenure. And, um, I, you know, Wayne has been a larger than life figure in a lot of areas of Northampton. Uh, and not all, uh, I don't see eye to eye with him on everything, but certainly when it comes to our area, we have been extraordinarily fortunate to have uh, a planning staff that has been so focused on affordable housing and finding creative ways to do it. I don't think that's always the case. And uh, I, I think that the landscape of affordable housing is uh, immeasurably uh, been improved by Wayne's participation for a long time. And I, I think we need to to really strongly give him a uh, well done on this front. Well, how would we, how would you suggest that we do that? That I, I think uh, merits a, a formal vote. And I would move that uh, we, we write a letter of appreciation to Wayne uh, and authorize uh, you know, somebody to do it and, uh, and send it on behalf of the partnership. Do we have a second? Gordon? 
Do we need to take a voice vote, Keith? All right. Gordon? Yes. Richard? Yes. Ace? Yes. Anna? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Gwen? Yes. Um, Bev? Yes. Jen? Yes. Edgar? Yes. Richard and me, I'm, I'm totally yes. Richard, would you be willing to write such a letter? And I'm assuming that that letter needs to go to Keith and then be, be sent out, right, Keith? Would you be willing to write that letter? I would be willing to write it. Uh, I don't know if it's better if you sign it as chair or I can sign it as a longstanding member. I don't, I don't know what anybody's pleasure is. Okay, well, we could both. We could both. Yeah, I think that. you're both fine signing it. Richard, especially yeah. if you've already, in, he knew, we'd know. Yeah, we'll both do it. You've known him a long time, and Carmen can yeah. add her name as the chair. Yeah. I just want to point out Bev has her hand up. I know if Bev, she's using it. Thank you. Thank you for helping me, Bev. This is a, a, a really quick question about um, what your conversations have been about when and if uh, to have in person meetings. That is an excellent question. We haven't discussed that and I, I'm ready to go back in person. I don't know, Keith, I think I brought it up one time with you. What do you think? I mean, I'll, I'll support whatever the, uh, the partnership, uh, you know, I, I personally, I'm, I'm at my house. It gives me an opportunity to go home a little earlier, but mm -hmm. um, you know, if you, if you all wanna do it in person, those roll, you know? Could we could we think of a hybrid model where we could have one in person meeting once every once every quarter or something like that, and then have the other two um, through Zoom? It, it's preferably uh, there's nothing wrong in the rules about it. Um, just uh, right now with the technology, it is a little more complicated. Uh, we are waiting on a piece of equipment, but there's also uh, anyone's talk to anyone who's done a class hybrid when you have two modes um, it, it can get challenging paying attention and everything else um, right but what I meant was having like one meeting a quarter everybody in person and then oh and, yeah and then the other ones everybody on zoom so it wouldn't be it would be like that yeah, just as long as we're communicating that um, specifically in the the agenda right um, there's nothing wrong logistically with that um, right yeah what do other people think Gwen has her hand up Gwen? um i i was just going to say the beauty of, of of one of the i mean you know one of the lighter sides of what happened during the COVID is that um you know people began to attend public meetings more and i mm -hmm. and i think that's been a wonderful and really really important thing and i I probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for that. So, um, you know, I would worry about um, just because I'm still in college and I'm still going to be, you know, I don't, I don't know what my schedule is going to look like or anything like that. But for me, that might be a little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can think about it. We can have a brief discussion about it again next month. We don't need to decide now. I, I would like it at least occasionally. But I totally get what you're saying, good point, and agree with that. Shall we, shall we table it for now? We'll come back to it. Looks like everybody agrees. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So then the, the last thing that I'd like to say is um, the first Monday in July is July 4th. So I think then we would move our meeting to July 11th. Okay. July 11th. Yep, that's how we usually handle that. Okay. Bev, do you have your hand up? No, scratching my head. <laughs> okay. I cannot see the top of your head. Anyway, I also want to say thank you to Hannah for helping me with the op-ed that has been thoroughly analyzed and, and dissected and now changed. I mean, that's perfectly fine, but thank you so much. You know, we had a good, we had a good team operation. That was very positive. Yeah. To, to end on another positive note, like thanks to everybody on the housing partnership for moving the broker fee 
uh, home roll thing forward to uh, legislation. I'm so happy and just wanted to acknowledge it before the end of the meeting. Thanks, Anna. All right, can we entertain a motion to end the meeting? 